Azerbaijan says that it has arrested a former leader of the Nagorno-Karabakh region as he was trying to enter Armenia. Ruben Bardanyan is a billionaire who made most of his fortune in Russia. His detainment comes in the week that saw almost a quarter of Nagorno-Karabakh's ethnic Armenian population flee. 47,000 people leaving their homes and their lives behind. Streams of cars continue to arrive at the Armenian border. Some of them have been waiting in line for days to reach safety. Azerbaijan's military takeover of the breakaway region of Nagorno-Karabakh last week prompted thousands of ethnic Armenians to leave their homes and their lives behind them. Margarita Sakyan is one of them. She and her family of 12 fled their village as soon as they heard the sounds of missiles nearby. They've taken refuge in this hotel in the Armenian border town of Goris. It has become a makeshift shelter. It happened all of a sudden. Nobody expected it. We were bombed at night. We didn't know where to go. We thought we'd run to the forest to wait until the situation calmed down. But we were told that we had to escape. I ran without taking anything, just my family. Margarita and her family suffered during a nine-month-long blockade imposed by the Azerbaijani government last December. The enclave was cut off from the outside world. There were critical shortages of food, water and medicine. We had no flour. No sugar, no food. I had no milk for my grandkids. Nothing. How can one live like that? Most of the refugees found shelter here in Goris, just 30 kilometers away from their homeland. Azerbaijan has promised to guarantee the safety of ethnic Armenians. However, Margarita says they had no choice but to leave, possibly forever. All right, I want to go to Washington now and bring in Azla Aydin Tashbash. She's a visiting fellow in the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution, as well as a global opinions com columnist at the Washington Post and a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. It's good to have you on the program tonight. Let me get your opinion just on the, on the numbers we've seen. We've seen about a third of the ethnic Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh leave this week. Do you think Azerbaijan will ever welcome them back one day? I think there is too much bad blood between the two communities and really three wars that have been fought since the breakup of the Soviet Union. I cannot imagine Armenians willing to go back, feeling safe enough to go back uh, and live under Azeri rule. In the same way, uh, Azeris uh, 30 years ago have fled uh, Armenian territories, mm. Armenian controlled territories. So this is layers and layers of uh, mutual uh, the, the, the historic claims and, and really fairly well documented history of atrocities that have taken on both sides. So it's been practically made living together very difficult. Yeah, you say there's plenty of blame to go around. The Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh is suffering this time, but Azeris, they've suffered in this conflict in the past. I'm wondering, how are these current events, how are they being viewed in Azerbaijan? I think Azerbaijan is not, the public uh, is not too focused on the uh, humanitarian dimension. Rather, it's seen more as a restoration of Azerbaijan's sovereignty. Because remember that Nagorno-Karabakh is technically inside Azerbaijan. It's been an Armenian-dominated, Armenian-populated enclave 
during the Soviet times, Armenians and Azeris lived there together, even though Armenians were the majority. And then later on, Azeris left in the 90s, uh, had to leave and flee during the fighting between the two nations. And now it's been Armenian only over the past 30 years. But of course, you know, for the Azeri public, uh, there's, where there's been a drumbeat of nationalism since the 2020 war, uh, the, the refrain is that Karabakh is Azerbaijan and that this is a restoration of Azerbaijan's sovereignty. Talk to me about what, what has changed in Azerbaijan to put the country in a strong position that it didn't have, as you said, in, in the 1990s when Armenia proved stronger. Well, uh, there is now an incredible asymmetry of, uh, uh, in power in between these two countries, which is a reverse of what it was during the breakup of the Soviet Union. Armenia was backed by Russia and had uh, Azerbaijan was distracted, poor, in disarray. And in the 90s, Armenians were able to capture some land beyond their uh, borders, Soviet borders, I should say, mm -hmm. and uh, led to an, uh, a number of refugee flows. Uh, but now we have a reverse situation. Azerbaijan has grown militarily very strong. It gets along with uh, Russia, uh, but is strongly backed by Turkey in a military and economic partnership. That's not like anything uh, historically, even though there is ethnic uh, affinity between these two countries. Uh, 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 there has never been this level of unity. 2020 war was a direct support from Turkey. And of course, you know, uh, President Erdogan uh, makes no secret of his support for uh, Aliyev, uh, President Aliyev in Azerbaijan. But beyond that, Azerbaijan has uh, good relations with Israel, uh, uh -huh. relatively good relations with the EU, because it has stepped in as an alternative energy source uh, since the beginning of the war in Ukraine uh, to replace the Russian gas. Uh, in a sense, uh, obviously not all of it, but uh, significant enough that uh, EU uh, leaders have been uh, courting Azerbaijan as an alternative energy partner. While uh, EU president has been holding talks between, uh, Charles Michel has been talks between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Yeah. Uh, the issue that we've yeah. seen now over this recent uh, episode is how little leverage European Union has, because there have been calls from Germany, uh, from United States, from European leaders, for there to be a non-military solution to the issue of Nagorno-Karabakh, calling on Azerbaijan to not seek a military uh, way to settle this issue. But it seems like European leverage over Azerbaijan is actually rather slim. And I'd like to get your take then on what you think Turkey is seeing when it looks at this situation and when it looks at this unprecedented geopolitical power equation that is before it now. What do you think, especially Erdogan, what's he thinking? Well, I think that there is almost an unconditional support for Azerbaijan as a de facto position. Uh, I think Turkey would also like to normalize relations with Armenia and open its border, but not ex at the expense of its relations with Azerbaijan. In other words, if Azerbaijan is to pursue peace, Turkey goes along with it and might like it, but if they are to pursue war, uh, they'll support that option too. So Turkey's position is just uh, unconditionally uh, linked to Azeri position. But on the broader strategic level, they seem to want the restoration of trade routes, which opens up Turkish uh, trade into Central Asia and uh, and all the way to uh, the rest of Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a corridor, middle corridor, that Erdogan sees as an alternative to other routes that are bypassing Turkey as sort of Turkey's eastward expansion. Uh, but that requires a normalization of ties between Turkey and Armenia, and it's just not clear at this point uh, whether or not the tensions between the two countries, between Azerbaijan and Armenia, is is going to end 
with this episode in Nagorno-Karabakh or continue uh, in the next few months? So let me just ask you, we've got about 30 seconds left. You know, considering the, the, just the, the power structure right now in the region, I mean, how likely is it that we could see this conflict, you know, blaze out into a, a bigger war? Do you think that's even possible now? I think that because this is a Caucasus, uh, we can never be certain. We have to be cautious about the worst case scenario. So this is really the time to push Azerbaijan and Armenia in to, to the back to the negotiating table to sign a peace deal. This war has to end here mm -hmm. because now both countries have their sovereign territory and they should now sign a peace deal in Europe. Okay can be the architect of that. And we will see if that happens. It could be in Brussels. Asla Aydin Tashbash, it's good to have you with us tonight. We appreciate excellent analysis on the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thomas de Waal is a senior fellow with Carnegie Europe, specializing in Eastern Europe and the Caucasus. He joins us from London. Welcome to DW. Um, are Azerbaijan's reassurances regarding Nagorno-Karabakh's uh, ethnic Armenians credible? Um, they're not very credible. Um, you know, this is a conflict which has been waged for 30 years. Um, there's been acts of ethnic cleansing by both sides, by which we mean that whenever soldiers have come near civilians, the civilians have fled. Uh, that happened in the 1990s. That happened in the war in 2020. There's deep hatreds and, uh, and feelings of revenge on both sides. So the fact that Azerbaijan launched this uh, military operation last week um, um, it's not su no surprise that, that Armenians fled, and it's no surprise that there are reports of um, atrocities, unfortunately. Um, we are hearing about an international mission being being sent, and, and Germany has been pushing for that quite hard, which is good. But, but, but let's be clear, this is a mission which will arrive more than a week after the worst has happened there. Right. So let's, let's you talk about this, this idea of ethnic cleansing, which Armenia has been accusing Azerbaijan of. Uh, you talked about people fleeing as soldiers um, arrive. Do, they, do they, 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 flee, they flee because they fear what will happen, or is there a deliberate attempt to drive them out? Well, I mean, obviously, um, you know, that we can't really say until, until we get the facts. Um, Armenia's social media is, is, is showing reports of atrocities of, of, of Azerbaijani soldiers looting houses and so on, you know, which is quite credible. But I, I think in, in, in most cases, it's just a matter of fear that, that, that um, the Azerbaijanis just need to be nearby and the Armenians know they are defenseless, that the Russians have basically negotiated their surrender. Um, and they have no op option uh, to flee because, you know, this is what has happened, unfortunately, uh, as in the Balkans, in, in every different episode of this conflict. And just looking at the, the broader picture, Azerbaijan is an important transport uh, hub and energy partner for the European Union. Has that compromised the uh, EU's response at all to this crisis on their doorstep? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, Azerbaijan is a transport hub. I think its uh, energy importance is a bit overrated. Um, there was a deal last year to supply gas to the EU, but but actually I think the volumes are going to be quite small. Um, but I think what Azerbaijan has been very clever at is kind of playing between the West uh, and Russia and, and saying to, bo to both sides that if you don't uh, support me, um, then I, I, will, I will deal with the other. And I think what's happened in the last week is a very decisive pivot towards right. Russia. The Western leaders, including the German foreign minister, were saying, don't do this, don't launch military action. The president of Azerbaijan seemed to be reassuring them that this wouldn't be the case. And suddenly this operation happened. The Russian peacekeepers stood down. Right. Um, and, and that's a very clear sign that, that, that Azerbaijan threw in its lot with Russia in this case. Thank you for outlining that so clearly for us. Uh, Thomas Deval from uh, Carnegie Europe.